So we have today released our crime statistics for the first half of 2016. Those are available on our website. Um, and there's really two messages that are highlighted. One is that the long-term trend on crime, sort of five to eight years, is a downward trend. And the more immediate uh, short-term trend over 18 months to two years is that crime is more or less static. Now, neither of those, I'm afraid, are, uh, are very interesting um, headlines. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity to pay particular attention to the area of gun and gang violence. This area has been covered by the news media quite frequently, also commented on in social media on a frequent basis. And there are obviously elements of anxiety and concern that are attached to the dialogue. So I wanted to make two messages today. The first one is that the Bermuda Police Service is doing everything that we possibly can to investigate, uh, to advance the investigations of serious crimes. As of the 30th of June of this year, there had been two fatal shootings and three shooting injuries. At this point, uh, in the third quarter of 2016, as of today, those numbers have risen to three fatal shootings and seven injuries. In addition to that, two non-firearm homicides have brought the total number of homicides this year to five. We are still appealing for information about the murder of Jason Mello on the 19th of August, as well as appealing for information around the discovery of the body of Javon Daniels in May. Two men were arrested in connection with the murder of Patrick Dill in May, and another two men were arrested in connection with the murder of Fikre Crockwell in June. And these two cases remain under active investigation. One man, as you'll be aware, has been charged with the manslaughter of Travis Lowe on the 26th of July. Now, overall, the crime report shows that Bermuda is still a safe place to live for most people, for the fourth consecutive year, total crime remains below 1,000 incidents per quarter. But the specter of gun and gang violence is troubling as it is persistent. It creates a fear of crime that affects everyone and casts a shadow over our other, otherwise peaceful island. While it is certainly important to continue to tackle these violent crimes head on from a police perspective, it is equally important we believe that the community is fully engaged in tackling the conditions that lie beyond the influence of law enforcement. We have said before that Bermuda cannot arrest its way out of this problem. Since 2010, we have had more than 50 convictions for murder, attempted murder, and firearms offenses with life sentences being handed down and minimum imprisonment terms of 25 years. Yet, we have more than a dozen cases still lined up to be heard by the courts and the gang members coming to our attention now are newer and younger. Bermuda must work to break the cycle at the front end because it is too late by the time the police become involved at the back. And that brings me to my second message. There is a tremendous amount of good work being done in and by the community, behind the scenes. We would like to do our part in putting a focus on that good work and keeping it in the foreground. Public dialogue, in our view, should primarily be aimed at solving problems and implementing solutions. Holding people accountable is one thing but destructive criticism is another thing entirely. Rather than find someone to blame for the gang problem, we would like to have a dialogue about what can be done to break the cycle of violence and reduce the tensions in the community that are increased by gang and gun crime. So to that end, we've invited four of our community partners to join us in a community engagement meeting to be held tomorrow night, Tuesday the 13th of September between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m at the New Testament Church of God Heritage Worship Center on Dundonald Street in Pembroke. I'll be joined by Martha Dismont from the Family Center who has joined me uh, today for this press conference, Kimberly Jackson from Mirrors, Gina Spence from the Champions Program, and David Lovell from Men on a Mission. The Minister of National Security, Senator Jeffrey Barron, 
along with Shadow Minister for Home Affairs, Mr. Walter Raban, will also be in the audience. We will be talking about the things that have been working so far and exploring what more can be done. This will be a solutions-driven conversation that will appeal to everyone who wants to make a real difference in tackling gang violence and making Bermuda safer. The meeting is open to everyone and I, he I hope to see everyone there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here in support of uh, the initiative. We all know that it is so critical that we begin to have real solutions to what is plaguing our community at the moment. Uh, myself, as well as Kim Jackson, co-chair of the Interagency Gang Community Response Team, was very happy to be on the panel tomorrow evening for this event. So we want to encourage the community to come and to be present and to provide solutions. I think we're a bit out of time for uh, talking much about what has gone on in the past. We really do need to find solutions. Our young men, young women, our children are at stake, and so we are very happy to be part of this uh, particular uh, event tomorrow evening and really want to encourage the community to come out and let's start on a new path of, of primarily solutions to, to address uh, what's going on in our community. So I stand here with the police commissioner saying, let's, let's get to solutions, Bermuda, and in one place in the world that we can get to solutions and actually make an impact is in Bermuda. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here and uh, I'm hoping that the public comes out and supports this. Thank you so much. What are you getting from the community that you deal with on a daily basis and their ideas is a solution? Well, actually, uh, this is what we want to hear from the community about tomorrow evening. The one thing we don't want to do is preempt some great dialogue that's going to take place. We're hearing quite a bit from uh, parents of things that they want for their children. So that's the work we do in the background is one-on-one is -on -one work with families and their parents their, their uh, children at this point in terms of real uh, solutions broad base let's hear from the community tomorrow evening about what they'd like to see but we're just doing our one-on-one -on -one work in the background I'm also doing some work with agencies to see how we can respond better to the needs of young people and therefore uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow as well Anyone else? So you mentioned that uh, you're seeing a, a new type of um, new type of person joining gangs no, I can't give you a profile other than to say the the gang members coming to our attention are new names and new faces, um, and they are younger people. So, if you think back to 2009, 2010, when we had this watershed moment, we we ramped up our law enforcement activities. Um, we came in contact with lots of people involved in gangs and violence and ancillary measures. And as we've said since then, we've had about 50 convictions. Um, so some of those offenders are no longer in the system to offend, but we're still having offenses committed. And that's because there are new people taking up the mantle. When you say younger, you got an age range? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be well, held to that, but, but certainly we, we, you know, we've had, uh, we, we've had, we've charged people as young as 18. And it's clear that they don't start their gang life at that age. It started before then. Anyone else? I think that, you know, every time we hear of another murder, we hear this catchy slogan, if you know something, say something. You said that the public are becoming more forthcoming, but just, just how has that changed the recent one? Well, I mean, I think we've almost reached a plateau. So one of the things the different agencies will talk about tomorrow night is things that work in their experience. So what has worked to make a difference? And from a law enforcement perspective, what's really worked for us is, is the... Uh, cooperation we get as a result from community engagement. So in order to have an investigation that ends up with enough evidence to lay charges, you need witnesses and you need people to come forward and either tell us what they know or to testify about what they saw. Um, and in 2011 and 12, we saw a tremendous uptick in that. And I think that's attributed to the amount and the degree and the depth of community outreach that that we did in the years leading up to that um, what we're saying is we need more of that it, it has to continue if we're to 
um, continue to have a fairly successful strike rate of investigations and convictions. But the other message to balance that is we can't just keep investigating, arresting, charging, convicting, and putting in prison for the rest of an adult life. That's, that's just not enough to fix this problem. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, so if we look on, um, and not with my strong suit, but uh, the table with the firearm <coughs> incidents on, on page six here, it does look like we've seen an uptick just, just in the second quarter of this year. Is that no, I don't have the table in front of me, but the one that you're looking at um, puts all firearms incidents in one graph, and that does include unconfirmed firearms incidents. So what, one thing that we like to pick out of the, all of the, that data is the amount of firearm fatalities, the firearm injuries, and the confirmed firearms incidents, and, and those are about the same that they've been for the last 18 months. And the other thing I would caution is just comparing quarters with quarters. I mean, three months is not a long period of time. Um, the, the number of crimes in Bermuda is, is a relatively small number. I mean, total crime is less than 1,000 units, if you like, per three months. Um, so when something goes up by 10 or 11 or you know 5%, the, these, these are not really statistically uh, significant events and we we prefer to look at events over a longer period of time to get a real sense of whether or not something is improving or getting worse. I feel the road traffic accident scene is not particularly pleasing to you is it? Well certainly from the fatal collisions um, you know we're, we're just not having the impact that we hoped that we would have because we're on track for the for the same number that we've been having for the for the last few years you know, longer term, the total number of collisions is actually coming down. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is the collisions that we do have tend to be quite horrific and, and a completely unacceptable number have led to fatalities. And we're still getting a number of them involved with drinking and driving. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So something that just springs to mind, and it's something I've been hearing online, is that people under the impression that there's been a spike in, uh, in Fight that motorcycle theft. Is that been the case? Are we seeing that? I haven't looked through specifically for that part, but has there been an increase in that? I, I don't know that there's been a tremendous spike. What we do tend to see is over the summer months that the numbers uh, increase, and anecdotally we attribute that to um, young, young kids who perhaps have a little bit too much free time on their hands. I know you don't comment on specific cases, but in recent weeks there was a young man showed up at the hospital with a gunshot wound to his hand. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing the gun was confiscated. Would he be facing charges as a result of that? Well, you're quite right. That's a bit too specific for me to get into. So in general terms, um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that his injury is treated first. You know, his health comes first. But after that, we'll have some questions about the allegation that a firearm was involved. Dennis, you spoke earlier about the success you had with the public's coming forward with information as a result of an outreach by your offices. Is the same level of outreach still going on today? I think in general terms it is. I mean, obviously we can't sustain every operation that we ever launch because we only have a finite number of police officers. So if we have them doing one thing over here, it means they can't do this thing over here. And sometimes we have to move people around to help cope with the load and the, and the, and the demand. So um, it's probably not a secret that our, our community action teams have been pulled back from their primary functions to help out on the watches. We had an incredibly busy summer um, with lots going on and we needed all hands on deck. The, the plan is to continue that until uh, January 1st and then put them back in their community. So, you know, sometimes we have to do that. We've, we've seen this before in 2010 when, uh, when I first took over, I, I inherited a serious crime unit that had about six staff and I increased that to about 45 staff because of the volume of, of violent crime that we were dealing with. Um, well, we didn't parachute those police officers in. We had to take them from other parts of the organization. And now, five years later, we don't have as many people in serious crime. They're spread out a little bit more evenly. So it ebbs and it flows depending on you know, the, what we're dealing with.